Welcome to Quantum Mechanics. This is Module 5, Lecture 3, Part 1. We're going to be talking about the canonical commutation relations and how sharp lines in an atomic spectra lead us to conclude that the commutator of position with momentum is equal to IH bar. So we're going to start now talking about quantum mechanics that goes beyond spin. This means we have to introduce some operators. So we're going to consider the operators for position that we're going to call x hat and for momentum that we're going to call p hat. In general, we don't expect position and momentum to only take discrete values in the way that spin took only discrete values because the particles can be found anywhere and moving at any speed, or at least we believe that that's what will happen. And in it will turn out that that is the case. Another important operator that we need to consider is the energy, because in physics we know that the energy plays a big role in essentially anything that we're doing. And the operator for energy is called h hat. In that, this image, unfortunately, the hat got cut off halfway through. And the h stands for Hamiltonian. That's named after a very famous British physicist named William Rowan Hamilton. He lived from 1805 to 1865. That's his charming picture there on the left. The Hamiltonian is simply the sum of the kinetic energy and the potential energy, at least for the problems that we're going to be considering through most of the class. All right, we have operators. The next thing that we work with are the eigenvectors and eigenvalues that kind of look a little weird when we talk about position. So I want to make sure you understand it. We're going to have a state vector that's a ket x, and it's going to satisfy an eigenvalue eigenvector relation given by x operator or x hat acting on x ket is equal to x number multiplying x ket. You can see that's an eigenvalue eigenvector relation because I have an operator acting on a state or acting on a vector is equal to a number times that same state or same vector. But in many cases, even though we've been talking about Dirac notation and so forth, this equation can often be confusing to people. So I do want to make sure you take enough time to be sure you understand it and can follow it. So to repeat one more time, just like we talked about the mantra that we stated in Physics 155 about eigenvectors and eigenvalues. This is an operator acting on the state that it is at location x and it gives a number x corresponding to the value of that location multiplying the state. So the state is labeled by x, and the number that comes out as the eigenvalue is given by x, and we also are using x to denote the operator. So there's a lot of x's in this equation. It's very important that you understand what this equation means in order to be able to follow and understand the things that we're going to be doing. So if you are having trouble with understanding what that means, it's a good time to get some help. For momentum, we of course have a very similar relationship. The momentum operator acting on the momentum ket is equal to a number, which is the value of the momentum, multiplied by that same ket, and we're using the label p that corresponds to the value of momentum to label the ket. This is actually very common that we use the same label in the ket as the value of the eigenvalue of the operator when we have this eigenvalue-eigenvector relationship. And finally, for the energy, we have the Hamiltonian acting on a state n is equal to E sub n times n. This is in the situation where the energy actually is discrete, which happens for bound states in quantum mechanics. Then you find that the Hamiltonian acting on a state, which now we label by n rather than E or E sub n, is equal to E sub n, which is the energy eigenvalue, times the state again. And you'll see this notation and how we use it throughout the course as we go further. So again, we're using this discrete labeling because the energy eigenvalues tend to be discrete, so we can sort of count them from the first out to the last. All right, we're going to be working in three dimensions. That means we need to generalize these operators to three dimensions, and we're going to use it with a notation that might look a little bit odd at first, but it's, a, it's designed to give us a sort of uniform notation for everything. So position, we're going to de denote R hat sub x, r hat sub y, r hat sub z. Those are the three Cartesian directions. 
and momentum is p hat sub x, p hat sub y, p hat sub z. You will see by the end of the second part why we're using this notation. The position operators are going to commute with themselves as do the momentum operators commute with themselves. You might ask why. It's because we can measure both of those independently of one another. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. The Hamiltonian is given by the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. So how do we write that? Well, if I know momentum, I know what the kinetic energy is. So it's 1 over 2m p hat x squared plus p hat y squared plus p hat z squared. Those are operators. And then the potential energy, I have to replace all the position coordinates with their position operators. But because the position operators commute with themselves, there's no issue with ambiguities in terms of ordering. It's all completely well-defined. I can put them in any order that I want. So it's just a V of Rx hat, Ry hat, Rz hat. We're going to defer the discussion about the commutator of position and momentum until a bit later. And that's really what the conclusion of this lecture at the end of part two is going to be. All right, before we go too far, we want to talk a little bit more about how measurement works. So in quantum mechanics, we have to understand how we relate these operators and the states that we are putting operators into to the measurements. So what we say is that if the system is in a state psi and we measure a property associated with an operator O hat, then the average value measured of that operator O hat, after we make many, many measurements, is given by the expectation value of psi O hat psi. I want you to think about that for a moment. Psi is a vector in my space. I act on it with O hat that gives me another vector in the space. And then I take the overlap with the original state psi with a bra. And that ends up giving me what the average value of all of the values for the measurement of the operator O hat will be after I repeat the measurement many, many times. This is not something that can be derived. This is essentially a postulate of quantum mechanics. The fluctuations about the mean are then given by the following formula. And this is a complicated formula. We're going to take a little bit of time to unpack it. We have to look at the square of the operator minus the average value of the operator. So in between the psi bra and the psi ket, we have O hat minus this expectation value of psi. You can think of that as the average value of psi multiplied by the unit operator. That whole thing quantity squared evaluated in a psi bra ket, a bra on one side and a ket on the other side. We foil out that inner part. We'll get an O hat squared. We'll get minus 2 the number psi O hat psi, and then the expectation value that is left, which I can pull out of the inner product, the expectation value that's left is psi O hat psi. So I get minus 2 quantity psi O hat psi squared. And then the last term will just give me a plus psi O hat psi squared. We are using in this the fact that psi overlap with psi is equal to 1, that the states are normalized. Now you see that the minus 2, one of those cancels with the plus, and I'm left with just psi O hat squared psi minus the average value or the expectation value squared. All right, let's take an example of this. Let's look at the average energy that is measured. It's equal to psi H hat psi. Now the first thing you might say is, how in the world do I evaluate that? Okay, well, we're going to use a very important property and that's the property of completeness. We've talked about this for two by two matrices, but it's actually a general property of any Hermitian matrix, no matter what the size is, even infinite dimensional uh, Hermitian matrices. And so what it says is, is if I sum over all of those eigenstates using the Ket bra butterfly-like form, which as we remember is an operator or a matrix, and that will just give us the identity when we sum over all of them. So I'm going to use the multiply by one identity, and I'm going to stick that operator in between the h hat and the psi. I'm going to just stick it right in between. It's multiplying by one. It doesn't do anything. And so there it goes. That is the one stuck in between the h and the psi. Now that sum over n can be pulled outside because that's just a summation. And now the h hat can act on the n. The n's are eigenstates. So when h hat acts on an n, it gives me a number times the n. In fact, it gives me en times that n. So I can pull that number out. 
And you can see here I have psi overlap with n and n overlap with psi. Those are complex conjugates of each other. So they become the modulus squared of n with psi. And that's a positive number that runs between 0 and 1. And we're going to call that the probability. We're going to have a problem that we do in class that will guarantee that that really is a probability. For it to be a probability, not only does it have to be a positive number between 0 and 1, but it also has to sum to 1 when we add up the value of that probability over all possible values that it can have because I have to have something. And so the sum of all probabilities must always be 1. So the average energy is a weighted average of the eigenvalues of the operator, that's the ENs, multiplied by the probability to measure that eigenvalue. So we're going to interpret this overlap of the energy eigenstate N with the state that I was prepared in psi, modulus squared, we're going to interpret that as the probability to measure the eigenvalue N, whose eigenvalue is equal to EN. This says that whenever we measure something, we're always going to determine one of the eigenvalues. Again, we saw that when we were looking at the Rabi oscillations in one of your problem sets. If we measure many times, we're going to get a weighted average, and the weights are determined by the square of the wave function, which is given by this overlap of the energy eigenstate with the state that I prepared by system in, which is psi. Fluctuations are given by an expectation value of O squared, which in this case is H squared. And we evaluate it the exact same way. When H acts on N, it gives me EN. So when H squared acts on N, it gives me EN squared. So I'll get the sum over N of EN squared times PN. It's the same PN. And then it's going to be minus this average energy quantity squared. All right. We want to now summarize what this all means for measurement. This is called the Copenhagen interpretation. What the Copenhagen interpretation says is that when we do a measurement and we measure a particular eigenvalue, and that's what we're always going to get is a particular eigenvalue for each instantiation of the measurement. So each time I do a measurement, I'm going to get one eigenvalue coming out. After I've done the measurement, the wave function immediately collapses to the eigenstate that corresponds to that eigenvalue. In the example that we were talking about, it would collapse to the state n corresponding to the nth energy eigenstate, which has an energy eigenvalue given by en. That is what is called wave function collapse. Again, this is a postulate. It is not something that can be derived. But this behavior exactly quantifies the behavior that we were using before in the earlier modules when we told you that the atom is stupid and it only remembers its last measurement. Once I've done a measurement, I collapse the wave function. Now it's in that eigenstate. And that's all that it knows is the eigenstate that it's in. And so since it only knows the eigenstate that it's in, it doesn't remember anything that it was in before that. Of course, we like to ask the following questions. This is all well and good, a collapse and all this other stuff, but what is the atom really doing? And how does what the atom does actually relate to all of this abstract stuff with operators and wave functions? These are very, very common questions to ask. The problem is there's no answer to these questions. Absolutely none. Just like we couldn't tell how an atom went through two slits at the same time, or we could not tell how when I have an entangled wave function, it knows how to anti-correlate the measurements, even when they're separated by a distance so far that even light could not travel between them. We don't know how it does that, and we don't know what the atom is doing when we haven't done a measurement. What we do have is a theory that tells us everything about what happens when we do do measurements. And since most of what we are going to be doing when we're interacting with the quantum world is measurements. That's really the important thing to know. What it means is we don't have any clear way of describing what happens in between the measurements. And this often goes in more into philosophy. And there's philosophers who work on this problem. It's called the measurement problem in trying to understand exactly what's going on. But we only have operators, expectation values, which tell us the average of the measurements after many, many measurements and probabilities, which tell us how often each of the different measurements are going to take place. 
That's all that we have, and everything that we want to learn about and talk about in quantum mechanics relates to those results. There is no, what is the particle really doing? There's no answer to that question. We should not be asking that question. And with that, this lecture is over. We do have a part two. In part two, we're going to be deriving the canonical commutation relation.